Varicella zoster virus, or VZV, is HHV3. And like HSV1 and HSV2, it's an alpha herpes virus. It's pretty well known as the cause of chickenpox, which is what you get with primary infection, whereas recurrent infection causes shingles or zoster. But let's start at the beginning and talk about how primary infection happens. So VZV causes skin lesions, and the way that a new person gets infected is that VZV aerosolizes from those skin lesions and is inhaled by a susceptible person. Now, just as a side note, you might read that people spread VZV from the respiratory route, but there's very little data to support this. Overwhelmingly, it spreads from the skin floating through the air. In the newly infected person, it first invades respiratory epithelial cells, and then it spreads to the tonsils, which are the local lymphatic tissue where it infects T cells. And these T cells then circulate throughout the body via the blood, as T cells are supposed to do, and thereby spread the virus throughout the body. We call this viremia, even though the virus is within cells in the blood, as opposed to floating around freely in the blood, as is usual for many other viruses like poliovirus. Eventually, VZV makes it to the skin, and there you get the usual itchy rash that you associate with the chickenpox. And from that rash, more virus can then aerosolize and go on to infect yet another person. This whole process following infection takes quite a while, with an incubation period that averages about two weeks. So the question is, why such a long incubation period? And the answer is that VZV uses only cell-to-cell -cell spread, and that's slow. The way that works is that because of glycoproteins made by VZV, a VZV-infected cell can fuse with an uninfected cell and insert its viral DNA into the new cell, infecting it. And the fused cells can actually form syncytia. This is very different from the usual process where viruses are released and float freely to find their new victims. If VZV did spread this other way, it might overwhelm its host and kill it, and that would not make good evolutionary sense. But with cell-to-cell -cell spread, the virus moves slowly, so the innate and adaptive immune systems have more time to overcome the virus. Incidentally, because VZV is mainly intracellular, it's hidden from antibodies, and so cell-mediated immunity is most important to control it. But now, if you've been paying really, really close attention, you might have an objection. If VZV is always intracellular, then how can it possibly aerosolize from skin lesions? Well, it turns out the superficial epidermis, the outermost part of the skin, is the one exception to the rule. It's the one place where the virus actually is released from cells and can float around freely through the air. And that's precisely why people get infected via skin lesions of others. So then the question is, why does VZV behave differently in the skin? And in order to understand that, we need to go more in depth into what happens when the virus infects a cell. First, as you'd expect, its DNA replicates in the cell nucleus. Nucleocapsids are formed there. And then the full virion, with its tegument and envelope and glycoproteins, is formed in the trans-Golgi network. So what now? This is where it gets interesting. VZV has mannose 6-phosphate in its envelope. And most cells it infects, most cells in the body actually, have mannose 6-phosphate receptors, which, among other things, cause the newly formed VZV virions to be directed towards large endosomes, where they become inactivated because these endosomes have an acidic environment. So as a result, the intracellular viruses don't go anywhere and are not infectious. So the main way that VZV spreads because of that is the cell-to-cell -cell method that we talked about. But here's what's different about the outer skin. Mannose 6-phosphate receptors are down-regulated. So in the outer skin, instead of getting directed to acidic endosomes, the viruses go to the extracellular space. And once released, the virus is well-preserved and infectious to others. So that was an in-depth explanation of how the virus is released from skin lesions. And so far, we've just been talking about primary infection. But now let's talk about recurrent infection. So during the primary infection, VZV infects sensory neurons and becomes latent there, just like HSV. And it can actually infect them one of two ways, either directly from the T cells or by transporting retrograde from the skin the same way that HSV does. The neurons it infects are in the dorsal root ganglia, as well as the cranial nerve ganglia and autonomic ganglia like those in the enteric nervous system. Now, if VZV reactivates in these sensory neurons, it can cause shingles. 
And the way this works is the same as with HSV. New VZV particles are produced that are transported and pterograde to the skin, and there they infect epithelial cells. And just like with primary infection, the virus gets released extracellularly and can aerosolize and infect new hosts.